This is Master Teacher Core Session 6, entitled Asking Good Questions. Hi, I'm Marcia Somerville, and I'd like to welcome you to this last core session of the Master Teacher Series. This is very much a part two of a presentation that aims at helping you to have more fruitful discussions. Now, Session 5 laid the groundwork for this one. Of the two parts, this is the more practical in terms of how-tos, but these how-tos really do rest on the foundational content of Session 5 and its homework. So if you've not viewed these yet, please stop watching this session and access Session 5 and its homework assignment before returning here. I want to begin this session by briefly reminding you of the main points that I covered in Session 5 and then tell you how they relate to what I'm going to cover in this session. Session 5's content was based on these three initial questions. What are the typical goals that untrained parents have when engaging in discussion? What are the typical obstacles to these goals that parents encounter? And are there better or clearer goals that would set parents up more for success, even before they start to fill discussions with any kind of content, such as asking good questions? Let's go through these in quick succession. Number one was, what are the typical goals that especially untrained parents have when engaging in discussion? Well, one of them is that parents want to go over the material in order to check comprehension of what's been learned independently. That's a common goal that parents come to discussions with. Another one is they want to get their kids to talk or engage with them over the topics that they raise. Another goal that they would have is to seek to follow published outlines that are in their teacher's manuals fully and completely, thinking that they need to get through them in order to be successful. And the last goal I'm going to touch on is that many parents are seeking to disciple their students in a Christian worldview through vibrant discussions. Now, while you may bring other goals to your discussions, these are the ones that we most commonly hear about when parents ask us for help with discussions. And these are the ones that I covered in session five. So I'm going to just stick to these four goals that I just outlined. So the second question that we asked in session five is, what are typical obstacles to these goals? Well, untrained parents are often mimicking traditional classroom discussions that they experienced in their own times in schools. They're thus not especially clear from the start as to what their goals for discussion should be in the homeschooling context or in the discipleship context, and they end up trying to force discussion times into formats that simply don't work and become frustrated and discouraged as a result, understandably. As we covered in session five, the word discussion has a different meaning from the words lecture, conversation, dialogue, or debate, though some of these can be parts of a whole discussion. When parents think that the goal is to go over the student's independent work, which I dubbed as educational ping pong or Q&A in session five, parents encounter stoppers. One stopper is that they find that this kind of Q&A session doesn't really engage their students in the vibrant discussion that they're looking for. And then when they start to depart from this format, they find that the open-ended nature of discussions, which truly explore ideas, can be messy and seem inconclusive. This then can sap their confidence such that they return to the safer ground of tidy, linear, if boring, question and answer sessions. Another stopper with Q&A is that parents are typically following a curriculum author's script, either in the form of textbook questions that are in the back of the book, and also that the student has filled out ahead of time or a real outline for discussion. The goal becomes then getting through the material as outlined. If instead they choose to go deep on a few topics instead of wide to cover the entire outline, parents worry because the deep delving seems to eat up discussion time and forego the goal again of covering the material adequately. So these are all stoppers to the whole orientation of the Q&A or the going over the material or the following of the written script because parents feel worried or concerned about stepping outside of these more familiar boundaries. Additionally, parents can also be squeamish about taking the lead or controlling the direction of a discussion. Sometimes this is because they failed to adequately prepare for the discussion. Sometimes it's because of the students not responding. Maybe the students are unprepared as well, or even more likely, we noted in session five that discussions can be personal. 
they involve owning information and giving statements about one's belief that can be both daunting and also very personal for young adults and so students can kind of clam up and make discussion difficult. So we asked the question in session five, are there better goals for parents to adopt than the traditional ones that they tend to come into discussion years with? We talked about the need to recognize that fruitful, powerful discussions that we're in search of are not Q&A that seeks to go over information. Rather, in their mature form, they're primarily opportunities for students to explore, internalize, vocalize, revise, and come to their own categories, concepts, opinions, and connections that they then have and can use skillfully for themselves. In other words, we want to think with our students about information, not go over information so that our students know it cold. To this end, a fruitful discussion might use an entire session to explore a single concept. So getting through the material or going over the reading shouldn't be our directive goals. Now, if you watch the video session from the critical thinking community that I assigned for Session 5 homework, you watched a skilled discussion leader work with a mature adult audience. This assignment was intended to give you a clear vision for your end destination in discussions, the place that you're working to get with your own sessions with your own children or students in small groups. It was not meant to discourage you. If you don't presently measure up to that instructor's skill in your current discussions, don't be discouraged. But instead, let's pray together that this session and other resources that God sends your way will help you to improve as a discussion leader. Father God, I ask you to give me good words now, words that are helpful, words that are hopeful, words that are specific, Lord God, that will help those watching to become better discussion leaders. I pray that any kind of sinful comparison or any kind of regrets looking backward would disappear, Lord. And I pray that this session would be a forward-looking session of how all listening might improve in at least one small area of their ability to lead fruitful discussions and ask good questions. I thank you that you're always with us to help us whenever we ask. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, so with the videos that I asked you to watch for Session 5 Homework as Background, in this session, I want to stress two main points. The first one is that the goals for discussion sessions change with the learning levels of the students. I plan to go through three main learning levels in detail and show you how your purposes and goals change with each phase and thus so do your questions. We'll work from youngest to oldest as we go. The second point that I want to make, and I'm going to make it at the very end and I'm going to be very brief about it, is that the goals for a parent teacher's self-improvement should be incremental and reasonable. Now before I plunge in with the learning level content, let's survey the big picture goals of mature discussions so we can keep in mind the cumulative overarching end game that we should have for our years of discussion sessions. If you've watched the assigned homework videos, you should now have a working understanding of the following points. Number one, the teacher leads the discussion by asking purposeful questions and or restating student points for emphasis and clarity. Number two, there are a limited number of kinds of questions that a teacher asks mature students. This instructor taught you eight of them. Number three, these eight questions can be applied to almost any topic that you and your student want to explore or think about. Notice, think about, not go over or enhance comprehension. Number four, one key central purpose for asking these highly useful questions of mature students over the course of their high school years is to model. We want the student to realize that these questions are the ones that can and will enable him to think clearly about any subject even after he's left home. Now what was not visible in this otherwise helpful working model of mature discussion from the good folks at the critical thinking community is a focus on shaping a Christian student's understanding of a biblical worldview and of the false nature of worldviews that oppose Christianity. I want to take a moment to ponder with you the role of revealed truth in relation to homeschool discussion sessions, whether solo discussions or in group classes. 
I believe that Christian homeschoolers must swim against the current of advice given to teachers in other settings about leading fruitful discussions in this one area. In researching for this session, I read repeatedly authors who asserted that the teacher must conduct discussions with no end agenda in mind, or else it wasn't a bona fide discussion, but a brainwashing session. And I beg to differ in this one special case. We Christians start each and every discussion with a reliable bank of revealed truth, with a capital T. It's resident in Holy Scripture, in the person of Jesus Christ, and in the leading of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. While we affirm the need to hold open-ended explorations that allow freedom of thought and the true examination of claims made toward any given assertion, we should not affirm the student's right to lie about God or about revealed truths that he has given us in his Bible. These truths tell us about fundamental precepts that we dare not ignore if we're to live wisely and well. They offer wisdom for life, reasons for why we find the world as we do, and warnings of the traps and lies that we, ourselves, and our enemy set for us. We should know, for instance, from the Bible, that people are sinful and unable to help themselves to become perfectly good or righteous, no matter how much circumstances, such as the life story of a friend or family member, may seem to contradict this truth. Faith can, at times, amount to believing that God's word is true, despite the evidence of our senses, or the way things appear to us presently. So while we affirm the open-ended nature of discussions, at the same time our students must be required to give us answers during discussions that are informed by and relate rightly to the Word of God. And happily this does not mean that Christians can't explore alternate worldviews, or else how would we understand others well enough to bring the gospel to bear on the sin-sick world that we are reaching out to? We want to lead our children in examining other religions and worldview claims on their merits and then look at the claims of Christianity. And then ultimately, we want our children to decide for themselves whether or not the Bible's revealed truths stand above all other man-made entities. The fact that there is a truth with a capital T needs no apology, should shape all discussions, and does not make us intellectually dishonest. Rather, including truth as the basis for our examination of events, characters, and the beliefs of the human race enhances our ability to do any sort of academic study because we have an unfailing, consistent standard by which to measure all things equally. This means that any time a student encounters an issue that he struggles with or asks a question to which we don't know the answer, we can turn back to Scripture. We can model a Berean attitude toward our world. Look for a moment with me at this passage from Acts 17, 10 through 12. Now this story picks up where Paul and Silas have been beaten in Thessalonica and their lives have been threatened. So we read here that the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away from Thessalonica by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Truth will always withstand scrutiny. Our young adults can and should explore and discuss alternative worldviews, but they have to do it with the Bible taken as an authority, a corrective lens, if you will, for what's false and evil in our world. When they come against differing perspectives, worldviews, theories, beliefs, and laws that countermand the Word of God, they must learn to think graciously about other views, but to stand firm on revealed truth, if indeed, and this is very important, they self-identify as Christians. If an older student hasn't embraced Christianity for himself, the wise parent will patiently and consistently proclaim and demonstrate, where possible, that the Bible is true, but she can't really require or determine that her student will fully embrace her view for himself. Apart from the enabling grace of God, no person can accept the Lord or His Word. Our older children really do need to decide for themselves whether or not to follow Christ. And though it can be terrifying to wait and pray and discuss the things of God while letting them make up their minds, often our giving them room to do these for themselves and on their own timetable, while patiently we explore the flaws in other worldviews, 
and the beauties of Christ in his word will be far more evangelistically effective than a heavy-handed approach that essentially says to them, my way or the highway. I've written on this extensively in my book, Love the Journey, especially see chapter 5, You Share Who You Are. I also have a blog post on this that I'll be assigning for homework. Now the last note that I'd like to make about the big picture of discussions is this. Assuming that you and your students are Christian disciples, we need to consciously cultivate humility and compassion. Especially because Christians are flawed and various interpretations of the disputable points of the Bible exist, students must learn from your example to take a step back and evaluate their own perspectives of truth as possibly flawed and regularly seek to examine why they believe what they do. Also, because we're giving them true power by teaching them to argue well and know the truth, it's important that they develop a heart of love, patience, forbearance, and dependence on God's timing that Jesus displayed and modeled for us. Now with these overarching dimensions and goals for discussion covered, let's go into the particulars of how we use our discussion times and ask good questions for the differing learning levels that we'll teach during the homeschool years. We'll start with our youngest students and work upwards in age and sophistication. With children who are just beginning to read, typically grades K through two, and those who've learned to read fluently so that they can read to learn independently, but who are still in what is called the concrete sequential phase of development. The purpose for your discussion times are to engage really in pre-discussion skills. As teachers of this age group, we don't really aim at, quote, the examination or consideration of a matter in speech or writing, which was our definition for discussion, but we will want to someday. So when we do discussion of academic content with grammar stage children, our purpose is to develop in them habits that will position them well for mature discussion in later years. Let me give you some idea of what pre-discussion skills will aim at, and then I'll give you some concrete examples and details. Pre-discussion skills include the following. Learning to verbalize thoughts or put thoughts into words. Learning to articulate an opinion clearly. Learning to give a reason for what one thinks or believes. Learning to categorize information. Learning to summarize what's been read. As you can probably see for yourself, holding discussions with younger children can build habits and skills connected with the verbal back and forth that's crucial to mature discussions. Let's take an extreme counterexample to show you what I mean. Let's pretend that you used a K-6 through curriculum that never once asked your child to tell you about a story he's read or a movie he's watched until he was in junior high. This grammar stage curriculum was all about information retention and used seat work delivered through the written word alone. All he's ever done is to fill in work pages and then take written tests in the back of work texts that he's read independently. Then suddenly, you buy a new worldview curriculum and it's all based on critical thinking and discussion for your now junior high student. Following your new teacher's manual, in opening your first discussions, you ask the student to verbally summarize his reading and then to pull out information and categorize it on the fly so that he can give his personal opinion of it, supported by facts. Such a student would stare at you blankly as you ask questions offered by the curriculum manual, even though these are rightly designed to get the student to engage in discussion activities that are appropriate to a junior high student. Obviously, this student needs some ramp-up time. He needs some pre-discussion skills honed in those earlier years. So let's now explore how one might use pre-discussion approaches to prepare any grammar student for mature discussions in the future. We'll take the example of your son having just read Boxcar Children, a fictitious story, as a fourth grader. If you don't already know about Charlotte Mason, she was an Englishwoman who lived from 1842 to 1923 and popularized a teaching technique called narration. Her approach turns out to be highly effective at preparing young children for later fruitful discussions. If you've never learned about Charlotte Mason or don't know anything about her, there's a lot on the internet that you can glean. For Mason, narration meant that a child who reads a book or a piece of literature like the Boxcar Children then retells it orally in his own words. Up until the age of 10 or 11, Mason thought this should be done verbally. 
both so that the child learns to articulate his thoughts clearly and so that he's not distracted by the strain of focusing on his handwriting or composition skills. As the child grew older, though, she thought that he should then transition to notebooking, uh, by which was meant that instead of giving these retellings orally, he would write them down as a method of both retelling the story and beginning to learn basic writing skills. Now, narration is not a true discussion because the teacher may ask a few beginning questions, but after that, Mason wanted the teacher to remain silent and listen to the student, not stepping in to correct any errors he makes. Therefore, it wasn't a back and forth. It was a retelling of the story in the student's own words. Now, narration is an excellent pre-discussion exercise because it's a useful tool for getting younger students used to presenting verbally things to you that they have learned independently. I use this approach extensively with my children. However, unlike Mason, I didn't scruple to lead my children with many questions, nor did I shy away from correcting inaccuracies or mistaken facts. What I found was that, as with those simple eight questions that the Critical Thinking Community videos modeled, there are really a very finite number of types of questions that you can ask to prompt narration. Let me demonstrate. If you're wanting the children to do narration over a storybook that they've read, such as the boxcar children, you might ask questions like these. Who were the main characters? Or who is the story about if you haven't taught the word characters to a young child? What do they do at first? And then? How did the story end? Which character do you like best and why? Who's the hero of the story? And then, what makes him or her a hero? Who's the villain of the story? Who makes good choices in the story? Tell me about them. Who makes bad choices in the story? Tell me why you think they are bad choices. Why would God not be pleased with the villain's choices? What did the hero do that would please God? Those are pretty much all that you need to get a child to narrate a story back to you. Those kinds of questions that set. So, for history, Tapestry of Grace doesn't provide questions specific to the events of history, but you can learn to use general narration prompts like these that I just demonstrated to simply get your youngster used to interacting with you about what he's learned from either read-alouds or independent readings of the stories of history. For literature selections in Tapestry of Grace, we do provide worksheets for each book that introduce young children to some of the terms that they'll be using in discussing literature's older students. These worksheets also function as notebooking pages of sorts for literature selections. Note that over time, these narration exercises train the student to verbalize thoughts, put his thoughts into words, articulate his or her opinion clearly, give a reason for what they think or believe, categorize information, and summarize what they've read or listened to read aloud. Now beyond narration, there are other helpful pre-discussion approaches that help youngsters to feel comfortable speaking in front of others or exercising a variety of oral genres. Here are a few examples. Probably you'll think of others as you get creative in these years. The students can practice giving short oral reports before a live audience. Like every Friday, they can give an oral report before dad after work. Or possibly you can invite neighbors in for oral reports from time to time. Students can practice giving verbal directions maybe to a place, or as a how-to, how to build a birdhouse, for instance. They can practice describing an object aloud, or a scene. They can practice participating in short, dramatic presentations. They can practice by reading aloud fluently, either to a sibling or to a parent. Or they can practice by reciting passages from literature or from scripture that you select. Now, in addition to all of these, many curricula call for significant rote memory work. In Love the Journey, I've written about my preference for memory work to be done in context of stories or of history. But whichever way you choose to do it, these grammar stage years are meant for filling up a child's mental storehouses with factual information that will also be essential to mature discussion. All of these approaches and techniques start very simple and build in complexity as the student gains physical and mental maturity and also confidence born of practice. And if you're sitting there and thinking, 
Wow, my kids are getting to the older end of this learning stage, and I never did any of these. Please, this is why we prayed. Don't despair. No recriminations. No sinful comparisons. First of all, let's remember, God is sovereign. If he had meant for you to do all of this before now, he could have enlivened you to these approaches before today. But he hasn't chosen to, for his good purposes. You need to rest in his love and provision of this session now and seek to look forward with anticipation to what he'll enable you to do, not spend time looking back with regrets and self-recriminations. Secondly, I want to reassure you that many kids pick up these kinds of skills just from the social interactions in families, with church friends, or in other settings. Many moms are naturally inclined toward a conversational style of teaching and towards drawing their kids out about their experiences of all kinds, things like, what did you do at the birthday party, or what did you do in children's ministry? A lot of you do this already naturally. You don't have to know about Charlotte Mason to have been naturally doing much of this kind of thing already. Thirdly, once you, the teacher, gain familiarity with these relatively simple skills and objectives, it's not hard to spot train your older grammar age student. Maybe you haven't been having him give oral reports, but you have been having him tell you about his day or his reading or narrating back stories. It's not that hard to focus in, for the remainder of the school year, for instance, on oral reports. He doesn't have to give that many in order to have the good experience that he'll need later on. I want you to notice that if you haven't done these kinds of exercises, and you have an older student that's not doing well in discussions, he may be unresponsive because he hasn't got the foundational underpinnings that a child who has done all of these pre-discussion exercises would have. You'll need to give him some time to grow. You might want to help him practice some of the simple skills that I've been talking about to build his confidence as you plug up those gaps. It's never too late to go back and practice simpler exercises with older children because older children pick them up much faster than do younger children. So, in summary, the point of discussion at the grammar stage is not to explore or categorize or analyze deep abstract concepts. These belong to later years. Rather, you want to help your young students begin to think about and internalize the information that they learn. You want to prompt them if they need encouragement, but you want to let them talk. Let them tell you about every fact they remember about a historical figure, place, or event. Encourage them to retell the plot of entire storybooks or videos. And above all, enjoy the interaction of narration. Center in on the learning and help them to enjoy it too while you build your relationship as a platform for future discussions. Now, let's move on to the next learning stage, which is the logic or dialectic phase. These are the students who are entering into, in, and coming out of puberty. You'll notice an overlap in my slides. I said that the grammar stage lasts from grades K through 6, and now I'm saying that the dialectic stage lasts from grades 6 to 9. I'll next say that the rhetoric is anywhere from 8th grade to 12th. That's because students develop into these learning stages at different ages. But grade levels, as we're familiar with them, are standardized to specific calendar ages. What we're talking about now is a stage of development that's very closely tied to your student's body. During this pubescent stage of development, tremendous physical changes in the body give rise to rapid mental shifts. As boys shoot up, listen to their voices drop, develop facial hair, and deal with intense cravings for shower, food, and sleep. The girls develop curves and menstrual cycles and deal with hormonal swings. Along with these physical changes that you can clearly see are new mental changes and challenges that might not be as readily apparent. Dialectic students suddenly desire to create categories for information that they know and to neatly fit their facts into the categories that they create. What often dismays them is to be confronted with the many facts of life that defy categorization. Dialectic students want everything to be black or white and get easily distressed, confused, or frustrated when they encounter the amazing array of grays in the real world. What you're going for with these older students during your discussion periods is definitely not Q&A or educational ping pong. Long about the sixth grade, you should have been able to verify for yourself that in the past few years, your child really can read to learn independently of your going over what he's read. 
Hopefully, then, you've weaned yourself off of the impulse to use class time to merely go over information for the sake of solidifying retention. From the early junior high years onward, class discussions should be about creating and clarifying categories and beliefs, taking the students beyond where they can go independently, and helping them internalize core concepts that rule our lives by driving our choices. We also want to be honing discussion abilities for the purposes of learning and clear communications about what has been learned. Now that's a lot of content that I just dumped in one place. Let's see if I can unpack it a bit for you. Building on everything I just said about grammar students, I'm going to outline for you the central purposes for holding discussions with junior high students, or dialectic as we call them in Tapestry of Grace. If your younger child has the benefit of having built habits of verbal communication with you, and if you treat your tween with respect and consideration during this fragile time, you can use discussions to help him or her gain a handle on their oh-so-rapidly changing mental world. A side benefit is that you can use discussions for a variety of parenting applications. We'll get more into this in a bit. Let's tackle the academic side of discussion with this age group first. The overall purpose for discussions in the dialectic years is to develop age-appropriate skills that students practice to become proficient before tackling rhetoric level ones. Briefly, these are learning valid categories for information and putting data into these categories, learning to actively listen to another person's argument and consider it honestly, learning to think logically and argue linearly, learning to make connections between data that they know and the world around them, and then finally learning to present logical arguments that are supported by true facts. One way to think simply about your overall goal is that you're trying to help your student go beyond where he can get on his own. For instance, he can learn information by reading, but can he sort it into valid categories that relate to his life such that it becomes useful to him? In order to help clarify the kinds of good questions that you ask in discussion at this stage, I'm going to identify elements of fruitful discussions. Here we go. As your child enters into these years, job one is to help your student to create categories for the information that he or she already knows or has just learned from their independent work at this level. We do this by asking questions that link insights and themes in readings of various kinds. In this way, we help the dialectic student to form connections. You can think of these connections as mental pigeonholes that students will learn to use to organize and link the data that they learn through their studies. For example, we might define with them the category of good leadership. Through questions, we help them to define that good leaders are, for instance, courageous, insightful, organized, faithful to their followers, and set a good personal example of whatever they lead others into. Now, as the school year unfolds, when the students encounter stories of various leaders in history or literature, we lead them by questions to populate that leadership category with examples of strong, weak, good, or evil leaders. As we go, we can also use the categories we develop to ask them to compare leaders. As we ask the questions over a course of time, we model this process of defining, populating, and using the categories that we're creating. Eventually, the end game goal is that the students understand how to ask our questions for themselves and use the categories that they've now learned about to evaluate, say, leaders for themselves. The final step in the process is that we help them to internalize or own from themselves the categories such as leadership by asking them to assess leaders whom they know in real life fathers, pastors, scout leaders, neighbors, maybe local businessmen, for instance. We know that a category or a concept is fully internalized when they can make key connections between the category and their everyday world and use it on their own. Another example besides leadership would be in the realm of applied theology. Assuming that your kids have been introduced to the concepts of the Bible in the younger years, during the dialectic stage, we would, through questioning and exploration and discussion, seek to introduce rudimentary theological concepts as categories. We would then populate these categories with basic stories from the Bible and church history. So, for example, if we have the category of faithfulness that we populate with stories from the Bible and of Christian history, we also ask the student to stretch further as he grows older, and we ask him to identify faithfulness or its lack 
in his own life and in the lives of family members and friends and church members. Later, students can be expected to analyze the world around them through the lens of scripture, but first they need to know these basic categories that organize the data of their faith, and again, to be helped with relating the data and categories to their world. So that's all under the first goal of helping children at this age to create categories and helping them to populate those categories so that they learn to form connections and relate them to their world. At this age, many tweens will express thoughts awkwardly or pridefully or angrily or fearfully, and I'm sure there's a host of other emotions that I'm not even listing here. Puberty is a frustrating time for most kids and many parents. It takes a lot of loving patience on our part, the mature adult, and an understanding of how the world looks from their eyes and how hard they're trying to get things straight to help us realize that they're often not trying to hit at us personally, even though it feels that way. They're really frustrated themselves and they're lashing out in general, and we often happen to be, especially for homeschooling, the nearest thing that they can hit. That's why discussion can be such a useful, fruitful parenting approach, as well as a powerful academic teaching tool. If you take the view that your tween is struggling to organize his thoughts, even as his brain literally melts down to just a few remaining synopses and then reconstructs itself along new pathways, you'll probably have more compassion for the sudden bursts of frustration, emotion, tears, and prideful elation that go with this stage. You can also go into discussion mode instead of terrorized panic mode if you understand these things whenever your tween questions things that you hold dear or, in fact, criticizes you for the inconsistencies in your life. If your son one fine day says, Hey, Mom, I thought you told me that lying was wrong, but you just lied to Aunt Matilda on the phone when you told her that you loved the birthday gift she sent. I heard you say that it was a hideous face when you opened it and that you need a place to hide it. Why'd you tell her you loved it? Take a deep breath. He's noticing a detail that doesn't fit neatly into his newly constructed pigeonhole called lying. He wants to know how you justify telling Aunt Matilda one thing and your children another when you open the gift. You can help him define terms and expand his categories if you hang on to your emotions and put your relationship between you and your tween above your hurt feelings at this sudden attack. You can explain that you do not like the object that Matilda sent, but you so love her thoughtfulness and care expressed by her sending it. It would hurt Aunt Matilda's feelings to know that you didn't like the vase itself, so you made her thoughtfulness and the vase into one thing when you talked to her. Now, technically, you did not tell the whole truth to Aunt Matilda. This is a fine line, and that's why it's frustrating to your child. You'll probably have to admit that it's a confusing area, and you might model wise behavior for your son by going with him to Scripture to find out God's wisdom for this situation. Ultimately, you might find yourself humbly revising your views. You might discover a little fear of man in your heart towards Aunt Matilda. You may decide from a search of scripture with your son that social fibs are not godly and tell your son that you plan to change your behavior in the future. This is great parenting and a good example of how discussions can be used in this season to both strengthen your relationship with your bewildered child and forward his ability to think clearly. Now, related to this vignette is another key element of fruitful discussion at this stage. We want to continue to develop the students' habits of good dialogue that we began to work on when they were in the grammar stage. In these years, we go beyond narration. We start to focus on the skills that contribute to respectful dialogue and fair argumentation. Thus, we don't have to make room for rude or abrupt or sudden or attacking verbiage. Students should be introduced to the tenets of active listening, and our good questions can help him with this. We can ask, for instance, can you tell me in your own words what point I was just making? Or, can you see any flaw in what was just said? Or, did you hear any key words that made my logical argument false just now? Or, can you list three points that Pastor made in his sermon today? These kinds of questions help students to concentrate on the main ideas and listen for key phrases that clue them in to important elements of verbal content. Furthermore, in groups, there's a great opportunity to work on respectful verbal interchanges. When students are in this categorizing and connections phase of learning, 
it can be really tempting for them to jump in and correct one another quite rudely, if only because the number of facts and thoughts swirling through their minds beg to be let out. One key goal, therefore, for teachers, especially in group discussions, is to train students to listen with humility to another's position without interrupting. Training them to jot down notes while others are talking is a useful skill, because many will fear that if they don't interrupt, they'll lose their responsive thoughts, and they're really important at that moment. Writing them down allows the student to keep the thought and then bring them back as the discussion unfolds in a more respectful way. Another key goal is to teach them to use respectful expressions when stating their views or challenging those of others. Put such phrases in their mouths as, my view is, or would you agree that, or could we phrase it this way? These are polite, releasing, and kind ways to phrase key points that your child might want to make. And again, your students will learn these more quickly and naturally if you regularly model them for them. Treating tweens respectfully should be one of your most cherished goals within all discussions and interactions at this stage. Remember, if you keep their hearts through this trying time, if they feel like you're sitting in their cheering section and not in their critics' corner, you're going to have a voice in their lives as they come into the years when you will no longer have control over where they go and what they do and whom they're with. Let's conclude this section with some brief points of what you're not looking for in students as they enter this dialectic or logic phase. While students may do some of what I'm about to list naturally, given flashes of insights or mature skills, in the main and plain, the following belong to mature discussions, not the dialectic stage. The ability to break down large concepts into categories without your help. The ability to form reasoned arguments amply supported by facts. The ability to ask good questions of others that clarify arguments or concepts. The ability to connect abstract concepts with everyday life without your help. The ability to be comfortable with shades of gray and questions of morality or ethics. The ability to be comfortable with indefinite or incomplete answers to complex or difficult questions. Now, having listed these that don't belong to the dialectic years, let's go on to explore the years to which they do belong, the rhetoric stage. The rhetoric stage, as I said, can come in anywhere after puberty, so between grades 8 and 12, typically a little younger in girls, but not always. Boys can be as late as 10th grade before they're truly into the rhetoric years. This is one of the great things about Tapestry of Grace. You have that entire spectrum, so you can leave your student in each learning stage until his body catches up or grows out of that stage and then go on to the next. So, let me introduce the central goal for discussions with your high school students, the ones that we in Tapestry of Grace call the rhetoric students. After clearing that puberty hurdle, your child's brain will be recovering from literal meltdown and begin to develop actual physical superhighways the neural connections that will work fastest and most efficiently. These will be along his most traveled thoughts. If your young adult spends most of his time thinking about cars or girls or the Bible or fashion or history, these are the neuron paths that will most fully develop in his brain. For this reason, as we said earlier, your clearest goal for discussion at this stage of learning is to ask a limited set of good questions over and over so that he learns to think about any subject because he's able to ask them for himself. Said another way, in these few remaining years in your home, your focus becomes teaching your young adults how to think for themselves. The goal isn't mastery of the subjects in high school, their content. They're going to go on to higher education for that and specialize. The goal is mastery of learning how to learn any subject and how to think carefully, clearly, and wisely as biblically defined about everything he learns. To young adulthood belongs the ability to finely tune discussion skills, assuming that the skills in earlier phases that I've already been describing have been practiced. Let's take a look at the special goals for high school discussions that are conducted in your home school solo or group classes. In outline form, here are the major important goals that we have for young adults. Learning to identify the worldviews and theories behind information that they read or hear. Learning to view themselves and the world around them, people, problems, and events, 
through the lens of Scripture. Learning to identify and to present their own principles, beliefs, and worldview clearly in both spoken and written formats. Learning to grasp more theoretical questions and think beyond just the facts. Now here are the skills that will enable your student to approach the above goals. The ability to break down large concepts into categories without your help. The ability to form reasoned arguments amply supported by facts. The ability to ask good questions of others that clarify arguments or concepts. The ability to connect abstract concepts to everyday life without your help. The ability to be comfortable with the limitations of being fallible, finite creatures living in a broken world that give rise to the shades of gray in questions of morality or ethics. The ability to accept that many concepts or problems have no one right answer and become increasingly comfortable with getting as far as you can and then leaving it for future reflection or discussion. Now, this session has limited scope and we're really already coming down to our time limit. Discussions with high schoolers is another huge topic that I'm not going to be able to cover fully here, so sorry. This session is entitled Asking Good Questions, so we're going to focus there for the remainder of our time together. We're planning to produce elective sessions that those of you who are teaching rhetoric students will be able to access, some of which are going to be conducted live in the future at Lampstand Press. So I'm hoping that this, again, is an introduction to further detailed sessions that we can go into about the rhetoric level discussions. At the beginning of each rhetoric level discussion, it's good to let the student know where you're headed. You might give a brief statement, like a thesis statement in an essay, that orients your student to the limited topic that you're going to cover first. For instance, you might say, this week you read about George Washington. Let's discuss his abilities first as a leader, then we'll look at him as a general, and finally we'll discuss him as a family man. Now, you might not get all the way to George Washington as a family man, but at least your student knows basically where you're headed, and he has a general outline in his head of the three kinds of topics or categories that you're hoping to cover during the discussion. Now, as you launch into the discussion, and especially if you're doing solo discussions at home, keep your opening questions from being too vague. Your goal is to ask leading questions that engage the student and give him sort of a ramp up or confidence as you enter in. If you have a group, you can offer some variety with your opening questions. You could open by putting a statement on the board and asking the students to react. For instance, you could write up on the whiteboard, George Washington was a great leader. Then you could turn to the group and ask, do you think this is true? Why or why not? And field a variety of answers before leading students to analyze this more thoroughly. Now, you wouldn't want to do this with a solo student because what if he looks like a deer caught in the headlights and doesn't know what he thinks about George Washington as a great leader? You're asking him to break it down in real time and give you an answer, and he's on the spot because he's just one. In a group, it works better because there's a general silence, and then some of the quicker-thinking students will muddle through and answer something, and then the other students will begin to ping and pong off of that student's initial answer. So it works better with a group to do something like this. Another thing you can do when you're opening with a group is take the pair and share approach to the same question. Say, okay, students, we're going to take two minutes here at the start for you to turn to the student next to you and share how you would evaluate George Washington's leadership. Then you give them the two minutes, and then in the end, you ask each pair, one person from each pair, to share what they learned from the other student. Or you can start the same discussion with what I call popcorn. You tell the students that you're going to go around the circle of students, and each one needs to share a sentence or two expressing what most impressed them as they read about George Washington's leadership this week. Now, the ground rule for this that I always made is that no two students can share the same thing. If you as a teacher, though, always choose to go around the circle in the same direction, the end students, the students you finish with, are going to have a harder time because a lot of what wants to be said has been said. So make sure you reverse direction frequently if you're going to use this technique. Now, as the discussion warms up, whether solo or with a group of students, one thing you need to become very comfortable with is silence. Silence is to discussion what erasers are to pencils. They are the thinking part of a discussion. Too often, teachers who are new to leading discussions with high schoolers, even those with proper foundations laid, misinterpret silences. 
A teacher can think that maybe the student is either uninformed or uninterested, or she can simply feel that she should either fill the verbal gap because it's awkward or uncomfortable, or she might try to help the student along by asking yet another question that fills the silence. The thing is, when we ask a good question that requires the expression of thoughts or beliefs, or requires mulling over of information, we need to give the students room to think about and then to verbally assemble before they process their answers. This takes a little time. Filling in that awkward space actually disrupts their thoughts, and it won't encourage them over time to stretch toward giving answers. They'll learn that if they're quiet, you'll talk, and that's not our goal. Especially with older students, don't expect instantaneous responses. Let the silences hang heavy and require your student to say something to respond before you attempt to give another prompt or ask an easier question. As the discussion unfolds, try to allow students to ask questions as well. Don't feel that you have to supply all the questions. As our video homework pointed out, if students are engaged in discussion, they're going to have questions in their minds. Now in solo sessions, you can encourage your student to voice a question with good questions that you ask like these. If you wanted to figure out if Washington was an able leader, what's the first question you would ask? Or, do you have any questions about Washington's leadership that we haven't covered yet? In a group class, you could use the same ones, but you can also allow students to question the statements that classmates make, and even allow mini debates to ensue. These are often very stimulating and fruitful sessions when students begin to cross-question one another. Students, especially as they're reaching rhetoric-level thinking, will likely have some tough questions to ask. As they begin to venture outside the home and interact more and more with the world around them, they're going to encounter numerous new worldviews, and they're going to encounter Christians who interpret the Bible differently than you do at home. Many, if not most, students will raise questions about their own faith. Many will have questions or comments that challenge Christianity or even question God. If you can retain a sense of the grace of God and a spirit of humility, this can be an excellent opportunity for a parent to win the student's heart to Christ and help him or her to see the love of God in their own lives. Students really need to feel that they can ask questions about Christianity and the principles that they've been taught without feeling accused of losing their faith or being caused to think that they're somehow lesser Christian because they have questions. Which of us adults has never doubted some tenet of Christianity or other? Which of us has never doubted the goodness of God? Which of us has never become unstable in our faith? Which of us started the Christian walk in full maturity? Our students are young. They need grace and space to question, to challenge, and to doubt. Our response should be to meet them where they're at with truth because truth will never fail the test of doubt. What doubting enables us to do is to reassert the tenets of the faith that make it the truth that it is, and show our students how it is that truth answers the questions that they have. And another thing that students need to be able to do is to be allowed to ask obvious questions and make mistakes aloud. Teachers really need to avoid sarcasm or belittlement in all situations and to quash the tittering of classmates when students stumble verbally in group class settings. As parents or loving classroom teachers, it really can be tough to watch a teen grapple with his faith, and our first inclination can be to turn to fear. As I discussed at length in Love the Journey, because we women invest so much in homeschooling, we can take on ourselves too much responsibility for our children's ultimate salvation and become both guilty and fearful when it looks like our teens are walking away from all that we hold most dear. This is an opportunity for us to learn dependence on our loving God. As with so many areas of parenting, we simply must turn our children's souls over to the one who loves them even more than we do. We don't become inactive, but we can't control outcomes. We need to pray and then to rest in the Lord and be there to answer our teens' questions as truthfully and sanely and unemotionally as possible. Because homeschool subjects so often relate to Christian discipleship, let me offer some practical relational tips for how to make this difficult situation when academics suddenly become spiritual questions 
to work out better. The key, as far as I can see, is to keep your eye on the relationship. As your student enters into the rhetoric stage, begin to consciously treat him or her as a peer whenever possible. Listen hard and long before you jump in with an observation or a correction or an answer so that that teen feels heard. Stay calm when your teen says something that is inaccurate theologically, seems absurd, or is just wrong. Remember all the times that you struggled with God's goodness, sovereignty, or love and seek to identify these with your teen. Share how you doubted once, but then this is what you found as you sought the Lord. Silence again really is golden in these moments. Take long pauses before you reply or try to fix things. And even then, keep your reply as brief as you can. Now, as you seek to identify with your team, you're going to need to admit that you don't have all the answers. One great practice is to offer to help them find satisfactory answers through Bible study or talking to someone who knows more about the Bible than you do, like your pastor or a layperson in your church. Really, encouraging your teens to study scripture independently on a topic has been very fruitful in my parenting life. If one of my teens seemed to be developing a troubling pattern in his life, I often gave him a deadline by which to complete a study on a certain aspect of life, and then I encouraged him to share what he found or learned. Finally, you want to keep the conversation flowing with your teens and try to create an atmosphere in which they have stress-free times to talk to you about the issues on their heart or about their questions without feeling condemned or corrected because you're in too much of a hurry with the everyday things of life. Many times this works into some late night sessions with your teens. I would encourage you to welcome those. I would encourage you to invite your teens into your room late at night to flop on your bed and share their doubts, their thoughts, their fears during these times and just allow them to talk without trying to fix them. Now, back to more academic discussions. In general, if you can consciously stay away from allowing discussions to degenerate into Q&A sessions where you go over information that was learned independently, you'll be able to keep your questions exploratory. A good mantra for discussion leaders and for parents of teens, by the by, is that we want to keep up a spirit of inquiry, not inquisition. You want to stay very aware of your position of authority as a teacher in your home school because without any intention to do so, we can become dictatorial or insistent of our own views unless we consistently and consciously model a gentle, inviting, respectful, and humble approach. High school discussions offer a golden opportunity to engage your student in an honest pursuit of truth in all areas of life. So you need to be careful not to become a machine gun peppering the students with questions so rapidly that he has no recovery time. This only leads to frustration on both sides. Instead, be willing to explore with the student and be willing to go deep, as we discussed in Session 5, rather than wide. Follow paths of thought to see where they lead. Your goal is to keep the discussion moving along and hopefully focused on meaningful content, but not to become too rigid in following a predetermined course. Try to allow the discussion to follow naturally from topic to topic, even if it means that you won't cover it all again as we discussed in session five. We need to adopt an attitude of grace also toward a student as he grapples with questions that may seem straightforward to you, but are new and confusing to him. Remember, the purpose of discussion is that he come to own and articulate a worldview that is consistent with truth, and this simply takes time. So patience with the process is easier if you keep this goal in mind. Now, also I want to cover that there's a difference between questioning to teach and questioning to explore. You'll typically do both kinds of questioning in one given discussion session. Staying conscious of the fact that you're doing either one is a skill into which most of us need to grow. Very few people do this naturally. Let me try to give you a few details on what each of these is like. So, because there is truth, we sometimes question to teach. For instance, a student might have inaccurate facts that need challenging, or he might express an unbiblical view as tenable. Gentle questions will draw his attention to his wrong thinking, and he will learn. Questions also teach when we're introducing a category or concept that's new. You might ask such things as, where have we seen something like this before? 
or can you compare this leader to a leader we talked about last semester? Questions like those. These kinds of questions are intended to guide the students to learn. There's a clear objective in your mind when you ask them. Now contrast those with those where we're just exploring but still providing leadership. Questions in this vein will sound something like these. So, do you think George Washington was a great leader? After the student answers, we might restate. So what you're saying is, or offer our own observation. Yes, and did you notice about him that, or ask a follow-up connection type question like, so if that's your idea of leadership, how about our current president? How would he compare, in your view, to Washington? Turning to another skill that we need to work at as discussion leaders is to make sure that our students feel that they are vital to the discussion. One way to do this is what we've already discussed, give room for pondering and expression, and ask questions that invite opinions. When students do go out on a limb and offer their thoughts to you, or to their peers in a group class setting, they need to feel that their contributions are recognized, valued, and considered legitimate, even when the content might need correction or redirection. Fostering this aspect of high school discussions usually prompts students to take the discussion time seriously. We are running down on time, but I want to say a word about those shades of gray that exist in life. When we discuss, we often pose questions that really have no one right or definitive answer. The issue that we're discussing is complex in these later years, and there probably is no black or white obvious solution. Examples of this would be the debates over immigration in our own current days, or whether to allow poor people to suffer for a lack of money in any single area, such as health care or education. The goal of discussions like these, and there are more and more of these as the high school years unfold, is not to arrive at a conclusion, necessarily, though many conclusions will be reached, or at least clarified. Rather, the purpose is to alert the student that, quite often, there are moments in life where we cannot arrive at a definitive answer to questions that arise. This can be really hard for students to accept, especially in those younger rhetoric years, because they want to have clear-cut black and white answers. It's difficult for them to enjoy a discussion that doesn't lead anywhere. This aspect of discussion grows along with the student so that a rhetoric level student in his later years is capable of realizing that some things will never have clear-cut answers. They practice resting in the sovereignty of God in these moments, and they set aside some of these questions for later study or consideration. Such discussions are what we have come to call in our family garden paths. The walk is the purpose. Neither the teacher nor the students need to have an agenda for an endpoint. They're enjoying the fellowship and exercise of just talking through an issue, exploring it but not necessarily pushing one way or another to a specific conclusion. It's often important to tell the student, hey, we're just doing a garden path here. We're just taking a walk. I don't have any agenda for the end of this conversation. This is especially true with parenting discussions, but it can also be really important with some academic ones. Now, all of these elements that I've been discussing are the stuff of which great discussions and a vibrant classical education are constructed during the high school years. This is a journey of discovery, and it can be exciting, heady, deep, and can capture the imagination of your young person for a lifetime. It's for this reason that we work during the 12 years that we have influenced our children's lives through discussion in the various phases so that we can send them out into the world as equipped apologists who are ready to give an account for the hope they have burning in their hearts, and thus through grace save some who are walking down the road to destruction. For this is the task of every Christian disciple, to make other disciples and to share the love that God has for fallen mankind in Jesus' name until he returns, is it not? I want to end this session by challenging teaching parents to look harder at themselves than at their kids if discussions are not going well at present. I think it might help you to assess yourself as a thinker. I'm going to describe four categories from within. See if you can find yourself in any of them. Level 1. I was basically told what to think all my life, and what I was told seemed right to me. I just don't question things much. Let me say it another way. The truth about most things seems clear to me, 
And I want my kids to think almost exactly as I do because I feel like what I think is right. Or how about this way? The truth seems pretty clear to me most of the time, but I live in fear that my kids won't embrace it with all the influences that pull them in the world. So I tell them what to think instead of exploring with them because what they think at their age is probably not going to be right. Level 2. I sometimes have questions about what I hear or read, and I know that there are complex problems out there for which there's no one easy solution, but it's pretty easy for me to be convinced of a given opinion by a good talker. Now, subset thoughts under level two would be things like this. I feel safest when I have a printed discussion guide or a leader from whom I can get all the right answers. Or, I'm easily dazzled by the categories or processes of critical thinking, and sometimes my kids seem to be able to outthink me. So I fall back on the Q&A style of teaching because even though it's deadening for them, it's more comfortable for me. Or how about this one? I fear that if I launch out into true discussion, my child may ask for information that I don't know, and then I'll lose authority as his teacher. So we don't do it much. Level 3. I routinely and intuitively question my world and the opinions of others, but uh, I've never been trained formally in logic or been given categories that help me to think in any systematic way or seen any mature discussion leaders in action. I feel like I get as far as I can and I could get further, but I just don't know how. Thus, I have hit or miss discussions with my kids. Some are great, some not so good. Here's another way to say level three. I feel like I don't have time to learn what I need to know in order to truly hone my abilities in this area now that I'm a busy mom. Besides, I lack any resources to learn from. Or here's another one. I'm routinely uncomfortable with silence, with circling around issues, with feeling like we're not really getting anywhere. I get lost in the woods of discussions, and I feel like I see many trees, but never the forest as an integrated whole. This makes me feel pretty inadequate as a teacher and unsure of the value of discussion. Level 4. I was lucky enough to be trained in the arts of dialogue, debate, and discussion, and I excel in this area, but one can always learn. I'm interested to understand more fully the categories and techniques that have been developed by those who've had the opportunity to study this topic more deeply than I have. I'm excited about digging into these resources that Master Teacher Sessions have provided and will provide in the future, and I'm eager to help other women that I know climb up one level from where they are right now. Now this level four lady, she's me. I would like to challenge you to first recognize your level from the list I just gave. And you may want to replay the tape, or you may want, if you're taking this for certification, to look at the handout where I've summarized these for you. And then I'd like to help you to level up one notch. No matter where you are, if homeschooling is your career, you need that continuing education mentality that will allow you over time, and with God's enabling grace, to become the best homeschooler you can be. In a real way, you're the key to great discussions, not your kids. If you're modeling lifelong learning by working to better your skills in information bank as you homeschool your kids, then they will likely respect you for it and emulate your example. So let me go back to those levels and talk about what leveling up would look like for each of them. If you wanted to level up from that level one person, Here's what I'd counsel you to do. I think that you need to see that there are shades of gray and complex issues that you really do need to think about. And you need to allow your kids to question and explore as they're getting older. Probably it would help you to re-watch the videos that you were assigned at the end of session five and really center in on those eight questions that can be asked of any subjects and begin to ask them regularly of your own world and of your faith so that you can deepen your thinking abilities. You probably also need to get it straight with God that he's in control and that your kid's worldview is ultimately in his loving hands, not your own. So I would counsel you to pray for outcomes, but not try to control them yourself by limiting your kid's ability to question, to think, and to challenge the world around them and their faith. Now for you level two ladies, I think you probably need to ask God to lead you to resources that will help you to break down complex issues for yourself. We're offering you some direction in leading you to the thinking community resources. There might be a couple of complex issues that you could pick, ones of our day, 
and you could take time to read up on both sides of the argument to help yourself become more comfortable with complex thinking. It really is in some ways that practice makes perfect. The resources that we had for homework in session five, coupled with the resources that I've given you in this session, really can help you to grow in learning to ask good questions that define an issue and help you to break down complexities. You probably also need to ask God to help you to become more comfortable with not having the answers to all the questions that your kids may ask. So you probably need to turn your attention to modeling for them how you and they together can find answers when questions arise to which you don't know the answers off the top of your head. Level three, ladies. In order to level up, I think you simply need to get down and dirty with those great materials that we were assigned for homework in session five. Maybe find and take a course on formal logic and also rewatch this session again and take some good notes. I think identifying the types of questions and how they function in leading discussions will help you. I also think paying attention to learning level specific pointers that I gave you in this session and making sure that your goals and purposes for your discussions are in line with those stages of development will really help you. Remember that you've also got to trust that your kids are learning from their readings when they read on their own, and it's okay to go deep instead of wide when that's how the Lord is leading you in discussion. This concludes the sixth and last core session of the Master Teacher Series. If you're doing this for official certification, congratulations on making it this far, and I hope that you'll have fun choosing subjects that most interest you from the elective sessions that we develop ongoing. Until that time, Thanks for all your hard work, and may God richly bless your day.